protect the integrity of this country. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, what has happened in South Africa in recent days, it's an issue that Nigeria and Nigerians and the Nigerian government should not take it for granted. We all, we all know that we are being called giants of Africa. But, sir, honorable colleagues, what we see outside the country and how Nigerians are being treated outside Nigeria does not show that really we are giants of Africa. Because we are being looked otherwise, we are being looked with different names, we are being looked as people that don't have the strength to stand for one another. If we check the population, that one out of four every African in the world, one is a Nigerian. But what has been our strength as a country? What is it that we can show that really, if Nigeria sneezes, Africa catches cold? We have not yet really demonstrated that and it's time for this House to stand up and show the world that we are our brother's keepers. If somebody like Malema in South Africa can speak against his people for doing what they have done, I believe that this House can stand for other Nigerians outside the country. And it's very important that we should look at this issue very well, and especially what happened still in South Africa in Gauteng, where they call it the city of gold, and what happened to Nigerians in that very place is very pathetic, Mr. Speaker. It's very important that as Nigerians, we should be able to look at our bilateral relationship with other countries. It's time that the House asks the executive to review our bilateral relationship with other countries. Because we will not sit down, and Nigerians are treated anyhow in other countries, and we do nothing. So today we know how difficult it is for a Nigerian to go and get a U.S. visa. Even some members here have been rejected U.S. visa. And Nigerians are treated in different ways and different manners in other countries. It is time that we should look at our bilateral relationship with other countries. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I call on the House to really look into this issue so that our bilateral relationship with other countries would be stiff. And not only that, so that tomorrow when we stand as giant of Africa, tomorrow when we really sneeze, other African countries will catch cold. By this, Mr. Speaker, whatsoever we are doing, will not go in vain. And by this, Mr. Speaker, and all our relatives and other Nigerians that we are representing that are other in other countries, they will stand tall as Nigerians. They will not hide because they believe that the House of Representatives, the National Assembly, is standing for them. I call on the House of Representatives, ably led by you greatly, that we should stand for our brothers and, speak, uh, and sisters out of the country, just like you have started. Honorable colleagues, Nigerians are calling on us to show the strength of who we are as the giants of Africa. I saw some of Mr. Speaker. The issue of uh, Zenovic broke out in South Africa, and uh, Mr. Speaker, to cut short his, uh, uh, his meeting uh, in Tanzania. Uh, but the issue before us that we need to look at is do we deserve this kind of treatment from South Africa? When we look back, 
when we evaluate our investment in South Africa, Mr. Speaker, and this is not, we've only seen a bit of South Africa now. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues, this has been the in thing across Africa. Countries that we've supported, that we have assisted. When they have civil war, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Sudan, Mr. Speaker, any time Nigerian is clamoring or contesting one election, you see these countries opposing us. And this is similar to what we are going through in South Africa. It's a human. In the Committee of Nations, this shouldn't happen, Mr. Speaker. When the global village, in the law arena, Mr. Speaker, we have African Courts of Human Rights. We have ECOWAS Court of Human Rights. These courts are international courts. They are courts that Nigerians should assess based on violation of their human rights. That Africa has signed on to protocol under African Union entitles every Nigerian to a free access, lawful free access in South Africa. There's no basis, there's no ground for South African citizens to take laws into their hands because we don't treat them in such a manner here, Mr. Speaker. Nigeria has provided a very friendly investment environment for our brothers and sisters from South Africa to invest. We also provided an environment for them to repatriate their profits. We don't deserve this kind of treatment from South Africa. I want to hold my colleagues to condemn the attack by South Africans or Nigerians. Mr. Speaker, you recall that a woman, an insurance broker, who was lawfully invited to South Africa to participate in the conference in South Africa was murdered in our room, in our hotel room. We cannot continue, we cannot continue to watch our citizens, our brothers and sisters, that the Constitution states clearly that the purpose of government shall be the welfare and security of our citizens. We need to look inward, we need to review our laws, we need to look, look at a bilateral relationship with South Africa and take a very decisive action on this matter. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to hear. felt saddened when I heard of the reoccurrence of this xenophobic attack yet again. This is an attack that has taken place before and no action has been taken as much as it has, the attention has been brought to light as this time around. These are Nigerians that have gone across the shores of this country to look for their legal ways and means of supporting themselves and making businesses legally in order to ensure investment in another African country. If we take us back during the anti-apartheid times when Nigeria assisted South Africa in attaining independence, we all are aware what Nigeria did, how much it contributed to the attainment of independence in South Africa. So Nigerians going to the shores of South Africa to look for their legal earnings is not an issue. It should never ever be an issue. And the action taken by the federal government to ensure that this, this xenophobic attack 
doesn't reoccur is highly commendable because our president and also the Minister of Foreign Affairs both sat down and there was a delegation that went specifically to the President of South Africa in order to ensure that this tragedy doesn't happen again. When Nigerians travel elsewhere abroad, they're treated like aliens. We must, as a parliament, stand up to ensure that we are welcome and we are welcome everywhere we go and also our visas are granted on and when due and like the mover of the motion quite rightly said when referred to the, to the foreign affairs committee I think other issues should come up similarly so I plead my, my heart goes to and pleads and goes to the people that uh, lost their relatives and we hope and pray that this thing re doesn't reoccur ever again. And I think that the President himself of South Africa should have come personally to condole and also to apologize to Mr. President on, the, on behalf of South Africa instead of sending a delegation. Thank you very much Mr. Speaker for giving me the opportunity. I would like to add a few words on the xenophobic attacks that occurred in South Africa. We need to have consequences for actions taken in South Africa. When there are consequences, it will stop being a reoccurring event. And um, as the speaker had voiced out, the people that suffered these attacks need to be compensated. The federal government of Nigeria must insist on compensation for all those that lost properties and their livelihood in South Africa. The South African government must come out and apologize to the families of those that lost their lives. There must be consequences for the actions of their citizens because it's been going on and it's not stopped. It's been going on for almost a decade now. And it's not only Nigerians that have been attacked. South Africans believe all other African countries that are their brothers should not live in their country. If there are consequences for their actions, this event will stop. So I want to add that there must be consequences for the actions of South Africans in South Africa. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable Ben. The, the Honorable Gagdi. Reaction has been nothing but ignorance. Ignorance of the basic information that's supposed to clear the minds of South Africans from what they think is to what they should know. What is that thing that is? Is South Africans believe especially the black South Africans. They believe Nigerians in South Africa are parasites. But the question is, is that true? They believe every Nigerian in South Africa has come to take the jobs that belong not to the whites, but to the black. The question is, is that true? The only way we can address this issue is by asking the Office of Statistics in our country to take up steps to analyze the various investments of Nigerians in South Africa and South Africans in Nigeria. Because South Africans are not aware of how much we have done for their country, especially currently, not during the apartheid, we're talking about currently. How many consultants from South Africa who are currently working in Nigeria, how many employees of South African origin who are currently working in Nigeria? How many expatriates, how many companies working in Nigeria? When you compare it, I am sure, very sure, very convinced that it is, they have more South Africans working in Nigeria than we have Nigerians working in South Africa. 
And just like uh, uh, my senior colleague said, Waloke, that we provided a platform for them to repatriate their money easily back to their country. The indigenous of South Africa, the black South Africans, they are not aware of this. They don't have this uh, history. They don't have these uh, statistics. So I want them to amend the prayer. I want to ask that the prayer be amended, mandating the Office of Statistics to document how many South African investments are in Nigeria as against how many investments, how many people who are Nigerians are working in South Africa. That will help clear this particular misconception that they have, that they are contributing more to us than we are contributing to them. I also want to say that it is high time we don't just take this lying low. If you listen to the uh, uh, announcement made by the uh, minister in charge of police, you will see that the government somehow is, was, was interested in what took place in South Africa. They were not totally against it. If you also listen to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, when she presented, Naledi, when she presented her report, you will see also that they are very soft with these ones who are committing this crime. And if you go down, you see South African blacks, they will come publicly, they will show their gun, and they say, we are ready to kill. Tomorrow, we are going to kill. We have marshaled out, we are giving, and nothing is being done by the government to go and apprehend them. These are the things when we go to negotiation table, when we go to discuss. As the Federal Executive Council are looking into it, as the uh, presidency is looking into it, let us bring this to their knowledge that they have not taken any proactive step to stop those ones who are known to be committing this crime. Thank you very much. This timely motion. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, I think I have not heard anything that pleases my heart regarding to inhuman act meted to African people staying in South Africa. In as much as, Mr. Speaker, that I don't understand all the actions of the citizens of South Africa against their fellow African nationals is unacceptable, I say, Mr. Speaker, without any fear of contradiction, that the responses by the government of South Africa is equally not understandable. Mr. Speaker, I say this because of these reasons. One, I don't want to talk about the apartheid era. I want to look at it in our own responsibilities as mandated to us by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I am wondering the importance that Nigerians' government seems to attach to the life of the citizens of Nigerians. I don't want to agree with material compensation, Mr. Speaker. No matter how much South African governments are going to compensate those that lost their properties, it cannot equate the value of one single human life. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that as Parliament, we should not watch South Africa lure us into material things. The apology is not enough, but what I want to say is we equally give room for South African government to behave the way they are behaving. Previous speakers have spoken. They have mentioned responses of South African government, particularly the Deputy Minister of Police Affairs of South Africa, where he seems to justify the animal admitted against Nigerians and other citizens of African nations. Mr. Speaker, I think if our government have taken aggressive diplomatic actions against South African government, I am sure they will not have come to Nigeria to be insulting the government of Nigeria and the citizens of Nigeria with a mere apology. We expect far better than the so-called apology by the South African government to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, I want to say that our actions at the end of the day, after debate on this motion, 
should be geared toward compelling Nigerian government to start without any delay initiating diplomatic reactions that will teach South African lessons so that they will value human life, so that they will be religious at least once in their life, so that they will see human life as a very sacred responsibility by God to protect. Mr. Speaker, I want to say again that I appreciate Nigerians because we are forgiving. That is a typical Nigerian man for you. There are South Africans in Nigeria, but Nigerians decide not to take laws in their own hands by responding the same way that those people calling themselves human beings, whereas they are animals who kill people and set them ablaze. Mr. Speaker, I maintain my stand before I sit down that until and unless the Nigerian government initiate a process of dealing with South Africa diplomatically, do not hope that our citizens, the people we represent, will be seeing us as people that will tomorrow face them and say that the statutory responsibility of government is to protect the life and properties of its citizens. And if that is the most important constitutional responsibility of every government, we need to do more than what we are doing, and we need to adjust the prayer to be more aggressive in such a way that Nigerians will know that their representatives at the National Assembly are quite conscious of their responsibility, particularly at its borders on human life. Finally, Mr. Speaker, let me thank the Nigerian citizens for behaving the way they should behave. The actions, the little actions of reaction from those citizens is understandable, but they have not even exaggerated it to my expectation. Therefore, I use this opportunity to say thank you to the Nigerian people for doing justice, for being patient. Thank you and God bless you, Mr. Speaker. of Delta State. Mr. Speaker, I am coming from a different angle on this aspect. Here, yeah, people who have been killed in South Africa who are Nigerian citizens. It's really pathetic and unfortunate. Here, yeah, shop has been lost. But there is an agreement signed between the South African government and Nigeria under a treaty. Mr. Speaker, when you looked at that treaty, Article 4 of that treaty reads, with your kind permission, I'm going to read. Article 4 of the treaty is a treatment of investment. A lot of Nigerian investment has been lost, not only human life. Well, a lot of investment has been lost. And Article 4 of the treaty that was signed between their former President Zuma and our President are very clear on this matter. The issues of restitution and the issues of compensation are clearly written and embodied on that aspect. Mr. Speaker, because if we are going for investigation, we are going to investigate that people have been killed. Yeah, the numbers will be given to you. We are going to investigate that Property has been lost. How do you replace those properties? Human beings cannot be replaced. Yeah, that's what happens in life. But at the same time, when we want to come into a compromise or an agreement with people in the Republic of uh, South Africa during this investigation, Mr. Speaker, the treaty is a very key aspect and very important and fundamental in paying compensation to our people. Because if you have destroyed issues that involve billions of Naira, you want to pay back those billions of Nigeria so that Nigerians that are returning back to, uh, from South Africa will be well compensated and they will take care of their family. And at the same time, it will not be injurious for that. So on this case, Mr. Speaker, I believe this investigation is not solely on Committee on Foreign Affairs. This investigation, because the foundation of this investigation is on treaty and compensation. This investigation revolving around treaty the treaty uh, committee must be involved. The treaty agreement pro uh, protocol committee must be involved so in order to unravel the agreement that has been signed with Nigerians. Mr. Speaker, distinguished honorable colleagues, during the course Order. of amendment... Order. Silence, please. During the course of amendment, I agree, the Foreign Affairs Committee will lead as a leading committee. But the committee on treaty, which is the fulcrum, which is the foundation upon which this investigation is going to base on, because Nigeria must be compensated as discussed by the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister. So on this ground, Mr. Speaker, I will amend at the appropriate time that the Committee on Foreign Affairs 
and Treaties, Agreement, and Protocol Committee should investigate the matter appropriately. I still rest my case, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker. But a lot of reactions that we saw in Nigeria was based on a lot of fake news that was spread on social media. There's this video, horrific, horrific video of a man being burnt alive. After a lot of investigations, it was revealed that this was a video of the burning of a South African thug about four years ago. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, that a lot of people were angry because of this particular video that was shared. There was this video also of Nigerians taking knives and axes away from the trunk of a car, supposedly in retaliation of the attacks. It was later proved that this was a rival gang video that happened in Durban four years ago. There's this video of a shootout as well that was later discovered to be a gang fight in Cape Town. I'm not doubting that there are xenophobic attacks in South Africa. It's been going on for years and it has to be addressed. And I'm thankful for this motion and I appreciate my colleague for bringing up this motion. And it's got to be dealt with. But Mr. Speaker, let's caution ourselves, let's caution Nigerians to be careful about fake news. When you get a video, when you get a story, verify it before you broadcast it. Some people cannot wait to broadcast on, on WhatsApp. Even WhatsApp meant for serious other matters, any, any, any message that comes, some people can't just wait to blast it on WhatsApp. Honorable colleagues, let us urge all Nigerians to verify our stories before we share them, because if we keep sending this, this kind of videos that we don't verify, it's going to keep happening. The kind of horrific attacks, revenge attacks that we had on innocent businesses in Lagos and all over Nigeria that happened. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for this opportunity. To also commend the mover of this motion and to also commend you and the leadership of this House for taking a proactive step. Of course, you cut short your journey to address this very important matter. And therefore, we have to commend, more particularly, Mr. Speaker, that you mentioned in the speech that uh, this House is ready to fund anybody who wants to uh, take a legal action. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that just like my colleagues just mentioned here, what South Africans have done to us, I think is very, very bad. It's on African. Africans, we are known to be our brother skippers. We don't even have border lines. We regard ourselves as one country. But for people to decide after helping them during the apartheid regime and to come forth to say, that uh, we are taking over jobs, and I don't know which jobs they are talking about. Mr. Speaker, I must stay on record that there are about almost 2.3 million immigrants living in South Africa, out of which 1.6 million are black Africans. It's only 700,000 that are other colors. So, Mr. Speaker, out of these 1.6 Africans that live in South Africa, they contribute only 0.001%. And that's what they contribute to the economy uh, in terms of holding good of, uh, uh, serious offices. The Speaker, it is the white minority that control 85 or 87 percent of the economy of South Africa. We, are, we black Africans, have some businesses, actually, but we are not CEOs. So, but when we provide jobs, if you go to South Africa today, we provided jobs for even South Africans. Our people are married to South Africans. They have children with South Africans. So they are supposed to be treated as Africans. Yet they go ahead to fight against us. Mr. Speaker, I want to say that I was a member of the Pan-African Parliament in the Eighth Assembly. And we should all know that Pan-African Parliament is made up of five members from uh, 54 countries. We, it's an arm of an AU. Therefore, I will urge the African members that are in this uh, parliament uh, to, when they get to uh, South Africa, because the sitting of the Pan-African Parliament is in Midland, South Africa, where all African legislators stay in South Africa. So it will be un-African 
to say that a country that hosts African legislators to turn around and be fighting Africans, this is very shameful, and therefore it is important that our members here, the delegation of Pan African Parliament in Nigeria Parliament, should register protest when they get to South Africa during the session. They should make a protest that this is actually bad and it cannot continue. But Mr. Speaker, I want to also say that as Africans, we must also take advantage to see the number of businesses, just like one of our colleagues said here, what are the business interests of South Africa here for record purposes. Let us also know what our Nigerian counterparts are doing over there. Uh, because people cannot lose so many property and they just do it like that. Mr. Speaker, I would like to suggest that we should take actual uh, account of businesses and individuals that lost their property in South Africa with the view to say that they should be compensated. Because we need to know there are people that have already been repatriated, but some came back hurriedly. I think documentation should be done. And finally, Mr. Speaker and honorable colleagues, well, I condemn the act. Well, I believe that it is very bad. We should also know that still we should not forget the spirit of Africa. That since the South African government has come forth and realized their mistakes and they've sent a special envoy and have actually apologized, we should make sure that we hold them accountable. They must show us proof that they are going to take care of uh, Nigerians that have lost their property and we too will review our position. I thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity. I thank you for my contribution. Yes. Time, sir. That Mr. President, who happens to be the head of this nation, must demonstrate, he must show it to everybody, that he has capacity to protect lives and properties, that the Nigeria should be given a special consideration when it comes to uh, international policies. And I want to say, make it very clear that the foreign policy of this country must be revisited because it's like people don't no longer take Nigeria for, as a serious country. So instead of coming to say we are asking for compensation, what would that do? When people are just treating us as if uh, anything can go, if you do anything, they will just accept it. Mr. President must show capacity. He must show to us that he's in charge and that he has the capacity to protect all of us. That is my contribution. And uh, we are buried. And today, the story is still the same. Like uh, Honorable Osai said, people have been killed. Properties have been destroyed. Relationships uh, between South Africa and Nigeria have been mad, as far as I'm concerned. Because if people have supported you in the past, and when there are people in your place, and you do not accord them some level of respect, I don't believe that anybody would say that that relationship will still be as cordial as it used to be. What am I saying today? What I'm saying is simple. That the speaker convened the body of principal officers for us to come back and make statements. I adopt those statements on the floor of this house. And I'm also adding that we as leaders should begin to take our country seriously, take our citizens seriously, no matter where they find themselves. Whether that it is in America, like my sister, the former Minister for State for Foreign Affairs, when she spoke, you will understand that she's speaking from points of knowledge about treatment that has been meted to Nigerians across board, whether it's in UK, whether it's in Singapore, whether it's in anywhere, they treat us as people who are not responsible. When I, of course, I know that most of us are responsible, even though there are some miscreants who go out there to discredit us. And um, our colleagues have said here that even the uh, deputy commissioner, or whoever in South Africa, did not seem to like condemn what their citizens were doing. 
because I heard him say, do we allow our do we allow our country to be taken over by foreigners? The foreigners are taking over everywhere and, and all that. So that means that there are some hidden issues that they are not telling us. I commend the Federal Republic of Nigeria for doing what they have done. But I'm also saying that in applauding what they have done and what the uh, House have also done by condemning this attack on entirety. I do not want us to lose focus by mere apology from the South African Order, please. All members Airport. should be seated, please. Honorable Woloeke. Honorable Woloeke and, and his group, please sit down. Yes, it's good to say I'm sorry. It's good to say we apologize for the killings. It's good to say we apologize for uh, one time dis uh, uh, dis uh, 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 destruction of properties and all that. But what's next? How are you sh assuring us that it's not going to happen again? Because many people will come back, like Nigerians have started coming back. I dare the numbers. Some people are, will still stay back because they have genuine jobs that they are doing. Assuming they don't want to come back because people who were born in South Africa will assume that they don't have any place to go to. Even if we, when you bring plane and say they should come back, they'll be like, oh, we are South Africans by birth and we have lived all our lives, we have uh, gone to school here, we do not want to go. Because some people feel the same, that even when you ask them to come, they will say they don't want to go anywhere else. So how are they assuring, uh, assuring us that those people who are going to stay behind are not going to face the same situation that the ones that are living uh, um, is facing. How are they going to assure us that it's not going to happen again, never again? How are they going to obey the treaty that Honorable Osai have said? Because I believe that as South, South, South Africa and Nigeria... Them and manner, members are supposed to conduct themselves in the House. And subject to the indulgence of the Speaker, I will read clearly this order so that members, if they are not combatant with it, they should be combatant with it. And then we should regulate ourselves in tandem with this clear and express provision of the order that we are giving to ourselves on our own volition, so much to, to regulate ourselves. And the order reads thus, that during sitting, all members shall enter and leave the house with decorum. Then, Order 8, when a member is speaking, no member may converse aloud or, may, or make any noise of disturbance to interrupt him. Then, unless invited by the presiding officer, no member shall approach or confer with the chair while the house is in session. So we should please religiously obey these rules because it is on our own volition, we gave these rules to ourselves with a view to regulating ourselves for the smooth conduct of the proceedings of this House. So we should please abide by the provisions of these uh, rules that we have on our own volition given to ourselves to regulate ourselves. Please. So having said that, Mr. Speaker, can I proceed to make my contribution? Your point of order is sustained. vision to this very important uh, debate. Mr. Speaker, I remain Honorable Mohamed Tair Monguno. I represent Marche Monguno Nganze, Federal Constituency of Borno State. Mr. Speaker, my own contribution is with regard to the need for a paradigm shift in our foreign policy. There is a need for our foreign policy to be citizen-centered foreign policy, so that our citizens, wherever they may be, should be the primary focus of our foreign policy and also in tandem with the fact that the primary responsibility of government is to protect the lives and property of its citizens. So there is a need for reorientation of our foreign policy to make it citizen-centered 
so that wherever our citizens are, all over the world, we should always strive hard to jealously protect and guard their interests. That is my, my, my contribution, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thrive in an area of mistrust. Business does not thrive in an area of violence. So we condemn it. If we want to have that common market, then our brothers need to accept our businesses in their country, just likewise as, as we accept their businesses in our own countries. That is the only way we can come together and take the benefit of the after agreement that has been signed. Mr. Speaker, let me come and join you in commending the effort of the Chairman and CEO of APIS, Mr. Lenoyema, in voluntarily surrendering his fleet, surrendering his equipment to go and evacuate Nigerians from South Africa back here. But Mr. Speaker, we read that there have been constraints by South African immigration, border control, in trying to restrict some Nigerians who are willing to return home. And our effort today is to come out loud, clearly, to ask South Africa to allow Nigerians who want to come back home to take the benefit of the free flight that has been offered by APs to bring them home. And Mr. Speaker, for other people in the aviation sector to be able to make this philanthropic contribution towards nation building, I think we need to listen to the advocacy of people like Ale Noyema in boosting the aviation sector in this country. Because if he did not have that enabling environment to operate, he probably could not have offered his fleet for the evacuation of Nigerians. So, Mr. Speaker, while the executive is relating with the executive in South Africa, I think that it is pertinent for Mr. Speaker and the leadership of this House to liaise with South African Parliament to see how we can join hands from the perspective or from the point of view or stand view of the legislature to see how we can complement and support the effort of the executive in trying to make sure that we resolve this. Having said this, Mr. Speaker, for us, we need to create an enabling environment back home for those people who are returning and for those who are staying to be able to realize their yearnings and their aspirations. Mr. Speaker, today, front page of Punch, we have heard about the cries of doctors who have left by enemy, doctors who have left the shores of this country to go and seek for greener pastures out there. Mr. Speaker, we need to come together from the legislature to the executive to the private sector to create an enabling environment for business to thrive so that we can address the issue of unemployment. We need to come together with policies and legislations to be able to ensure that there is security so that investment can be attracted into this country. So, Mr. Speaker, I lend my voice, I support the move of the motion, and I adopt in totality the views as expressed by other speakers in support of these motions. Those are my humble views, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for this opportunity. Communities loses their identity or its identity. This is exposed in South Africa. It's clear that the history of what Africans, and especially Nigeria as a country, played a role during their apartheid, they've forgotten it. It's a challenge for the youth globally what they can do in a country where a lot of people came to help them. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I sympathize with Nigerians, Africans, and the whole world because that it's affected almost all in South Africa and the families that lost their life, loved ones and businesses. Mr. Speaker, I would like to speak directly to the President of South Africa that apology cannot cut it this time around. You cannot allow these murderers, these thieves, these killers to kill innocent Nigerians and you just offer an apology. There has to be consequences. This is a global village where we don't recognize borders in Africa. We are brothers. It is clear also that the thieves and these killers are powerful than the government because the police in South Africa could not control these activities or this event for days. We need to know why. If there's a connivance, to hurt Nigerians and other African nations there, we need to know. 
I join all other honorable members here. Yes, we are learning a lesson from this event. As Nigerians, we need to create our own brand. We need to say yes, people have traveled, let people come to our country also. This is a role that the federal government needs to play in creating our brand, our businesses, so that Nigerians will stay, the youth will stay to have work to do in Nigeria. The government of South Africa must show commitment in saving the lives and properties of Nigeria. Just like the senior colleague talked about treaty, this treaty must be respected and this investigation must be done in tandem with what was agreed on because there has to be consequences, Mr. Speaker and honorable colleagues. A call for Nigerians, it is high time to develop our country. It is high time to tell the people living in our country we can do it here in Nigeria. And that is why it is time to take Nigeria to the next level. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I rise to fully identify myself with the passion, with the commitment, and with the exhibition of solidarity and patriotism submitted by all other speakers on this floor of this great chamber, the House of Representatives. I think what we have done today is, I want to believe that we have come to a time then Nigerians, where Nigerians within and without Niger within and without the within and without the, the, outside the country will believe that this is a house that is competent enough to stand for its people as enshrined in the constitution of the federal republic of nigeria mr speaker let me also thank you as leader of this house for the efforts you have taken the commitment you have exhibited as a leader of this house as the speaker of the ninth house of representatives to remind members when you had to cut off your trip, official engagement in Tanzania to come back and engage yourselves, engage yourselves in several consultations with the executive arm of governments, with other legislators within the Green and the Red Chambers to ensure that Nigerians in South Africa are protected and they remain proud Nigerians wherever they may find themselves. Mr. Speaker, that is a show of leadership, that is a show of direction and a commitment to the fact that we can stand for our people at all times. Mr. Speaker, I would like also to thank members, like I've earlier said, all we have done within here and without, our expressions in individual and collective capacities through barriers for us, was also a patriotic exhibition of our commitment to the life of our people and the protection of the integrity of Nigerians wherever they may find themselves along the globe. Mr. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the leadership and on behalf of the entire members of the House of Representatives to also say a very big thank you. I repeat a very big thank you to the fourth estate of the Rim, the members of the press of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. They have also identified with us in this fight. They have done well. The world has had them and they have professionally done what they're expected of. And that is why we will continue to count on them as the fourth arm of government as far as Nigeria's democracy is concerned. My dear brothers in the press, the speaker thanks you well. Members of the House of Representatives commend you, and I, the leader of the House of Representatives, also commend you. Mr. Speaker, in the end, I also will, would like to remind our colleagues that as a parliament, especially the ninth House of Representatives, which you all know is committed to working in harmony, I repeat, to working in harmony with the executive arm of government, especially when it comes to affect the welfare and well-being of our people remind you that only recently, Mr. Speaker, and I'm doing that in my capacity as the chief ambassador of the Nigerian government on the floor of this respected house, that only yesterday, a special envoy from South Africa, respected envoy, came and met with the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria directly with the president and commander-in-chief of the Federal, of Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari. They came with what they call an apology. Apology. And to the best of my knowledge, Mr. President has honorably accepted that apology on behalf of the 360 members of the Federal House of Representatives, on behalf of the 109 members of the Senate, and also on behalf of the entire members of the entire citizens of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I would like to say, wrongly or rightly, 
this is an institution that must also bring to there in the context of our debate today that we have also respected the position of Mr. President by accepting the apology from the South African government. If there is any other thing we must now do is to pray that those by agreements, those by agreements of such apology must have to be respected in areas of stopping this barbaric happening in Africa and South Africa against our people and against every other national in South Africa. Also looking at the fact that the agreement to compensate people who were carelessly, carelessly destroyed of their properties must also be respected. I believe there are a lot of other agreements reached and agreed between Mr. President and the South African convoy. I believe this house is the house of the people and as, in, as an institution that will have cause to even relate with, foreign, uh, with other global institutions should at this point respect that agreement between the two governments and now wait to see the, uh, the implementation of all agreements reached between the two governments. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I think that is my position and I want to urge every other member of the floor of this house to please look at it as, look at it as such. May, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to protect the Federal Republic of Nigeria, protect the citizens of Nigeria wherever they are, and protect us as a continent of Africa, and even all over the globe. Thank you, and I address my submission, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. By the Committee on Foreign Affairs, and once by the leadership of the House, for a full and proper briefing on what happened, what transpired in South Africa. Because it is only when the committee or the leadership or the House is seized with facts that we can actually address the issue properly. It is unfortunate that on all those occasions, the Minister has not responded to the Chairman's invitation. And even when the Chairman wrote on behalf that the leadership needed to meet with the Minister, he did not respond. I believe we are one government, and I believe we are here to serve the interests of Nigerians. I want to use this, this platform to send a direct appeal to the minister, and all ministers for that matter, that we need to respect the invitation that comes from this house. And particularly the Minister of Foreign Affairs because of an issue that is so important. If the house invites any member of the executive in our pursuit of happiness for all, then I think that should be respected. We will, um, we will take amendments. I think there are several of them. Honorable was, it was right that the People's House should commend him publicly for what he has done and the sacrifices he has made. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today because guess what? He was airlifting yet again 320 Nigerians today from South Africa. So he will be here. He sends his apology. He will be here tomorrow. And I will encourage members to come in so that we can show appreciation on behalf of Nigerians. So he will be here tomorrow. So I'm not sure if your amendment, which I see here to include that, but I think there, there's another component to your amendment. We can even actually formalize it. Include it in your amendment. We'll formalize it. So move your amendment. Give it.